Digging through the ruins of Morier, I was unable to find the cause of the region's destruction. Tales of heroes and villains were numerous, but vague to the point that a definitive ending was impossible to pin down. Still, after spending an inordinate amount of time and burning a considerable amount of incense, there were a few pieces of useful information found in the rubble. This collection of ancient spells is perhaps the most valuable treasure recovered on my expedition to Moria. However, I am left wondering whether returning them to the world will help the virtuous or condemn the rest of us to the same fate as that cursed continent. Who doesn't love a good spell? They do wacky effects, can deal a considerable amount of damage, and bring combat to a screeching halt while a player has to sort through all of their cards. Naturally, the only way to solve that last problem is to add more spells to the game. Wait, no, no, that does the opposite. If you want to read the text version of these spells as I'm explaining them, pop on over to the Patreon. There you'll get the text version of all these spells, you'll get the text version of all of the subclasses from Morier, as well as character sheets from Building Character if you want to put together a quick one-shot to test out some of these homebrew ideas. I'll remind you again at the end of the video, but I always get people asking where they can find the text version of this stuff, and I put this in every video, so I don't even know if it's actually effective. Anyway, the first spell. Our first spell comes from the Caverns of Atropolis, where demons crawl up the walls to Lydia's school of monsters. The scholars there found that casting a thunder spell in an enclosed space often resulted in a more potent effect. Refining that further led to the Echo spell. Echo is a first level evocation spell that forces a constitution saving throw on creatures in a five foot cube. Failing that, they take 1d6 thunder damage, half as much on a successful save. On the surface, this seems absolutely horrible. It's a small area and a small amount of damage. However, its power arose from being cast in rapid succession. If the Echo spell is cast in the same area before the end of the original caster's next turn, the area of effect increases by 5 feet on each side, and the damage die increases by a d6 as well. Since this spell was so easy to cast, artificers, bards, wizards, sorcerers, and druids could all figure out how to cast it. Joining their voices together would create a cacophony of chaos. There's no limit to how much damage the echo spell can eventually do. However, eventually the area will eclipse the caster, and they'll end up taking the damage as well. Whether or not it was worth the time it took to build up or the damage the caster would take was up to the person casting the spell. With a name like Avarice, it is no surprise that this spell comes from the casino city of Asek. However, it was not used on the gambling floors. Instead, it was used by coaches in the Grand Coliseum, typically bards or clerics, to inspire their champion to deal the most damage possible. If a creature fails a wisdom saving throw, they get advantage on all weapon attacks for the spell's duration. However, enemies attacking them will also have advantage. In a way, it's quite similar to the reckless attack feature of Barbarian, but with enough strategy, it could be more of a bane than a blessing, opening up less martially focused characters to a lot of damage. The cards, the cards, the cards. Another gift from the city of Asek, counting cards was most typically used by bards, though wizards could also learn it. Most wizards just didn't hold themselves in low enough esteem to consider casting it. With this, a caster would spend their actions spraying a deck of playing cards on the floor in a 20-foot square. Creatures inside had to make a wisdom saving throw, failing that they were unable to leave the square until the spell ended. Every round an afflicted creature spent in the square not picking up cards, they would take 2d4 psychic damage and have disadvantage on attack rolls, ability checks, and saving throws. To pick up a card, a creature would roll a d20 as an action, picking up a number of cards equal to the roll and needing to pick up 52 before the spell ended. For some reason or other, Undead seemed to have disadvantage on this rather childish gambit. Oh man, what'd you have to go and do that for? though that could have been an exaggeration of the texts I was reading. Maybe I should lock a bard in a room with a few zombies just to make sure. I believe that the Gilded Coast of Moria was the first place the Icicle Weapon spell was used, however, the Icicle Weapon left very little evidence behind. 
This conjures a simple melee weapon made out of ice. It's magical in terms of overcoming resistances, and the caster could add 1d6 plus their casting modifier in cold damage to attacks made with the weapon. Druids, wizards, sorcerers, and warlocks were able to use this to great effect, especially upcasting it since that added an extra d6 of cold damage to each hit. However, it was dispersed fairly easily, either by breaking the caster's concentration or dealing more than 10 points of fire damage to them in a single round. During their pilgrimage from Clothopolis to Asek, the devout servants of the sun liked to keep their friends close and their enemies far away from their close friends. The deliverance spell allowed clerics, paladins, and bards to teleport a creature within 60 feet of them when they took damage using their reaction. The friendly creature would land within 5 feet of the caster and hopefully allow for some healing on the caster's action. Oh, you can have a dream about drowning in oil. The corrode spell came from the Lakian Wastes, which left it a bit more deteriorated than the other spells I found. Wasters used this spell as a means to burn through rivals' steel, forcing a dexterity saving throw on a creature. Failing that, they would lose two to their AC at the start of each of their turns, or until they could make the save. Once their AC dropped to a minimum of 10, the acid would begin to corrode their flesh, dealing 3d6 acid damage per round instead of lowering their AC any further. Apparently it was also very easy to use, with artificers, druids, wizards, sorcerers, warlocks, and rangers all having access to it. They may cast it in different ways, but the result was always the same gooey puddle. Hot damn hot water hot shower. Another spell now from the Lakian Waste, Geyser found a pocket of hot water underneath the scalding sands. Creatures in a 20-foot radius circle would be subjected to a dexterity saving throw. Failing that, they would take 4d6 fire damage and be launched 50 feet into the air. If this caused them to hit a ceiling, they would take 5d6 falling damage, in addition to the 5d6 falling damage they would take when they landed. Depending on the environment, this could be a very potent way to deal some damage. However, in the Lakian Wastes, it was more often used to knock a rival off their mount. Oh yes! 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 We got it, baby! We got it! With various demons and devils having various resistances, scholars at Lydia's School of Monsters found that the best way to deal with the demons was to deal a lot of damage in a big area with multiple types of damage as well. Thus, Thundersnow. Thundersnow forces a constitution saving throw on creatures in a 60-foot cube, dealing 4d6 cold and 4d6 thunder damage to those that fail, half as much to those that succeed. This also halved the movement speed of creatures who failed, allowing wire weavers to get in and clean up any demons who didn't die right away. Can I give a little stretch? And a bend. The Bend spell was used by the Guardians of Clothopolis to prevent the Wasters from entering their sacred city. With it, they were able to warp a set of metal armor or barding, creating a personal-sized prison for the person inside. This incapacitated the creature and dealt 2d8 bludgeoning damage to them per round until the spell ended after a minute or the caster's concentration was broken. While it was only ever effective on creatures wearing metal armor or barding, the fact that there was no attack roll to miss or saving throw for the enemy to pass made this an incredibly consistent option in the hands of artificers, druids, or wizards. A spell of Lydia's own making, Fall relied on the hypothesis that demons lived underground because they feared great heights. Whether or not that was actually true was irrelevant, as all demons came to fear the fall. It allowed warlocks, wizards, or sorcerers to make a melee spell attack against a creature. Failing that, they were overwhelmed with a sense of falling. I have been falling for 30 minutes! For the next minute, they would be paralyzed and deafened by the sounds of rushing wind. When the spell ends, they take a d6 of psychic damage for every round they spend paralyzed. Even if the fall was only in their head, it was very, very real to them. While the Lakian Wastes were mostly full of martially focused characters, high-level clerics and druids were able to find a very useful niche. The Sandstorm spell whipped up wind and dust in a 60-foot radius sphere, forcing a dexterity saving throw on creatures inside and heavily obscuring the area. Failing that saving throw, they would take 4d6 piercing damage and be blinded, half as much damage and no blinding on a success. 
Originally, this was used as a defensive tactic, as any ranged weapon attack made into the area of the spell would fail automatically. But the winds would just end up scooping up that ammunition, adding a d6 to the damage dealt per round. This led to teams of wasters immobilizing creatures inside, and then teaming up to fire as many arrows into the storm as possible, and absolutely rip someone to shreds with a bunch of wayward projectiles. Send me someone to love us. Spellcasters seem to have an innate fascination with fire, and it is no different in the Morier region. The magma spell differentiated itself from a standard fireball by immobilizing creatures in a 20-foot radius circle on the ground. Failing a dexterity saving throw, the creature would be melted to the floor and take 6d6 fire damage, half damage, and no immobilizing if they succeeded. They would repeat this saving throw at the start of each of their turns or when they entered the area for the first time. Even if the magma didn't restrain them, the entire area became difficult to rain and dealt an extra d6 of damage to large-sized creatures, and larger creatures took an additional d6 for every size they moved beyond large. Cooling the fire with a gallon of water would force it to rapidly harden, forcing another dexterity saving throw on creatures within 5 feet of the area cooled. This would restrain them in hard molten rock, forcing a DC 20 athletics check to break out. Or they could try and smash the rock, which had 30 HP and 15 AC. After a minute passed or the spellcaster lost concentration, the entire area turns to stone in this same way. Since so many casters love fire, it's no surprise that this could be cast by druids, wizards, sorcerers, and warlocks alike. Get ready! The corruption and corrosion of the wastes would create some interesting weather effects that would often be replicated by higher level casters in the area. Acid rain created a 40 foot radius, 80 foot high cylinder of acid that heavily obscured the area and cost four times as much movement to get through. Creatures beginning their turn inside could not dodge this acid and would instead have to endure it with a constitution saving throw, taking 5d6 acid damage on a failure or half as much on a success. The swirling of the acid made it nearly impossible to find a sense of direction. If a creature inside was trying to move, they needed to make a perception check against the spellcaster's DC. Failing that, they could only move in a random direction determined by a D8. Pairing the spell's massive area with movement confusion and movement restriction led to a lot of overconfident barbarians becoming lost in the sauce and melting as a result. Crueler sorcerers, warlocks, and wizards delighted in this punishment of martial hubris. Does it have to be human? This final spell is the one I am most fearful of falling into the wrong hands. The Devour spell did not originate in Morier, but rather the empty dimension from which the mirrored soul sorcerers sprung. It allowed a caster to make a melee spell attack against a creature dealing 12d8 plus 50 force damage on a successful hit. If this reduced the creature to zero, the caster would devour their entire essence and heal an amount of HP equal to half their HP total. Since there was nothing left of the creature destroyed, they also wouldn't be able to be brought back to life with anything other than a true resurrection spell. The images of sorcerers and warlocks casting this spell were disturbing. Some with their jaws dropping all the way to the floor, others had their stomachs open up and skip half the digestive process entirely. The only similarity that appeared in all was that the caster was holding a dining fork. Presumably, this was the material component required for the spell. So, now that I've shared my research with you, do you believe that these spells should be introduced to the rest of the world or left in the sands of Morier? What's your favorite spell? What's your least favorite spell? You can let me know on my Patreon. At the $2 tier, you'll get access to the Discord where people are discussing all of this homebrew. That's also where you'll find text versions of all these spells and subclasses, as well as every character sheet from building character to set up an easy one-shot to playtest the material. If you can't join the Patreon, that's fine, I totally get it. Just support the video by liking and subscribing and leaving me a nice comment. Nice comments help the algorithm even more. And come back later for more from the Gilded Coast of Morier.